Okay, good evening. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we, my name is Paul Revel. <clears throat> I'm a professor here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, I'm also the founding director of the Education uh, Redesign Lab, and I'm on behalf of the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Ed Redesign Lab, I want to welcome you to this Asquith Forum. We're thrilled to have so many of you here with us. Um, Asquith Forum is our way of engaging not only our own community, but the extended community in a conversation uh, about the important and pressing issues affecting children in education, and uh, that's exactly what we'll be doing tonight. Uh, I also want to greet those who are with us online via live stream. All of our streams, uh, all of our forums are streamed live, and we invite you to watch future forums even if you can't get here. And for information on this and other uh, Asquith forums, uh, please feel free to visit our website. So, <clears throat> This nation has a long and rich history of uh, working collaboratively, collaborative action, which is our topic for tonight, a collaborative action on behalf of improving outcomes for children. Uh, Alex de Tocqueville uh, first chronicled this in his early accounts in the early 19th century when we were relatively new as a nation, and he noted Americans penchant for coming together in voluntary organizations to work on solving knotty problems together. Uh, we can see this same spirit in the work of Jane Addams in Chicago and the founding of Hull House and the Settlement House uh, movement in the late uh, 19th century. Uh, and if you jump forward a whole century, you can see it uh, in our own HGSE graduate Jeffrey Canada's work in the Harlem Children's Zone in the early 1990s, uh, that same spirit of coming together to solve complicated problems in his putting together the Harlem Children's Zone. So we have heart as Americans and substantial capacity to come together and work collaboratively to solve complicated, painful societal problems. A more recent manifestation of this spirit of collaboration, this American spirit, can be found in the famous Stanford Social Innovation Review article by Kanya and, uh, Kanya and, and Kramer, uh, which is entitled, uh, well, which focuses in on the topic of collective impact and uh, became a seminal, or, uh, seminal piece in terms of defining really a new field of work uh, but it really is a rose by any other name, it's still a rose. It's that same collaborative instinct, the collaborative action instinct that goes way back to the founding of the nation. And so we're gathered tonight to talk <clears throat> about how we as communities, leaders and ordinary citizens come together to work to improve the lives and the future prospects of the children of those communities. That's really the focus of the work, regardless of what name we give it and how we talk about it in particular. And many of you in the audience are deeply engaged in this work. Uh, we have with us uh, 25 or so cities from around the country who are with us at the Education Redesign Lab in a National Leadership Institute uh, where we're spending a lot of time looking at the work they're doing as teams in their respective communities coming at exactly this problem. And there are many others, students, faculty, members of our community who I can see out in the audience who I know are deeply engaged in this kind of work, work that moves beyond the sort of simplistic notion that we'll get to equity and excellence, we'll get to success for all of our students if we just have a good school system. And this conception of the work is broader and suggests that schools alone by themselves aren't sufficiently potent, taking up 20% of a child's waking hours, to accomplish the goal of getting all of our children ready for success. I think we've amply proved that by now. But the question is, how do we come together, make common cause, collaborate, which is so much easier talked about than done, to have impact, an impact that we can measure and see the success in the lives of children. And I'm hopeful, I think this gathering represents, and the work that you all are doing in the field, represents a renaissance of this American spirit of collaboration, which I, for one, hope will be coming center stage to our national dialogue about young people, about youth development, and about where we need to go in the field of education in particular. So that's why we're gathered here tonight. We have a wonderful panel uh, to uh, talk with us about 
this. On your far right is Jennifer Blatz. Jennifer serves as the <clears throat> president and CEO for Strive Together. Pardon me, I'm getting over a cold and I have to clear my throat. CEO of Strive Together, which works to accelerate the process of cradle-to-career partnerships to change systems and create better and more equitable outcomes for kids and families. Prior to Strive Together, Jennifer helped to launch the Strive Partnership, a cross-sector cradle-to-career partnership serving Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky. This was one of the most notable collective impact initiatives in the country, which led to the launch of the National Cradle-to-Career Network. Drawing upon her passion for improving education outcomes for underserved populations, Jennifer has made her career in the social sector. This includes serving as executive director of the Ohio College Access Network and supporting the growth of the National College Access Network. Jennifer is also a thought leader in the field, most recently co-authoring a featured piece in the Stanford Social Innovation Review on the evolution of collective impact and a more explicit focus on community voice and authority. Next to Jennifer is Michael McAfee. Dr. Michael McAfee is president and CEO of PolicyLink, a national research and action institute focused on advancing racial and economic equity, uh, just and fair inclusion for everyone living in America. He brings over 20 years of experience as a leader who has partnered with organizations across the public, philanthropic, and private sectors to realize this vision. <clears throat> Michael came to Policy Link in 2011 as the inaugural director of the Promised Neighborhoods Institute at Policy Link. Under his leadership, Policy Link has emerged as a national leader in building cradle to career systems that ensure children and youth in our nation's most distressed communities have a pathway into the middle class. The only thing that matters right now in Michael's mind, this is something about which those of us who know him have no doubts, but the question that he asks himself periodically is, is he personally and organizationally worthy to lead this movement? And finally, we are joined by Laura Pinsonault. Laura is the Director of Evaluation at the Spark Policy Institute. She has more than two decades of work with community-based organizations and collaboratives. Her approach to evaluation is rooted in justice, equity, and using evaluative thinking to drive creative solutions. Spark Policy Institute and its partner, ORS Impact, recently completed one of the first rigorous studies looking at collective impact entitled, When Collective Impact Has Impact, a cross-site study of 25 collective impact initiatives. So let me just say a word about the format and then we are gonna get right to it. Uh, we are going to sit down now, I'm going to sit down, and we're going to have a conversation uh, among our distinguished panel. Uh, and then after a period of time, we're going to ask if you have questions after I turn off my telephone. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, we're, we're going to then have questions from you in the audience and a chance for a conversation with our panelists. So without any further ado, the, uh, the first question that I wanted to ask our panelists is to um, tell us a little bit about the, uh, your view of the state of the art in collaborative action. Uh, and I'm going to come with some more specific questions uh, later on, but each of you has a particular perspective on this work and sort of at a broad 30,000 foot level, uh, what do you see happening? What's the state of the art? What are the challenges? And uh, later on, we'll talk about where we need to go. Laura, you've just looked at it in some depth, so why don't you get us started? Great, great, thanks. Thank you for having me. Um, I feel as an evaluator, I should be able to just kind of spit off my tongue. What is the state of art and collaborative action? Um, we've had the opportunity um, both uh, throughout my career as well as um, my most recent year at Spark to get to work um, at multiple levels with collaborative action and with collaborative groups from collaborative funders networks to collective impact efforts that are trying to implement the model as pure as they can. And, and I think, um, especially after spending the week here with all of you at the redesign lab, just continuously thinking about what that question means to me. Um, and, and what I've really fallen back on is that there are multiple states of the art in collaborative action, um, and that it primarily falls upon the characteristics of the communities and groups that are doing that work. Um, and what we've seen in our work where there is the most powerful 
Collaborative action has been where a team is coming together um, of powerful leaders who are incredibly creative, incredibly tenacious. This is really messy, difficult, hard work, um, and are ready to, to kind of stick their foot in the ground and say, hey, how can we look at this problem in different ways? Um, I, I think when I joined Spark about a year ago, um, I had primarily worked in health and human services, working with community-based organizations, and one of my very first projects was actually working with a collaborative funder set, uh, a set of national collaborative funders on advancing nuclear security innovations, which was far outside of my breadth of expertise in content. Um, but what we all shared in common and what we could bring to the table was that they were willing to think about how they could elevate policy at a very high level, not just in instituting new policies, but also thinking about how to protect existing policies. Um, they were thinking about, throughout the course of the five-year initiative, how the political environment was changing their work and constantly watching what was going on and being responsive to that work. But also, really importantly, they were bringing new players to the table constantly. Um, they had spent the first year of their work as independent funders. Co uh, collaborating with engineers, um, and that was primarily who they were bringing to the table to solve the problem. By the end of the project with them, we were engaging media. Netflix was engaged with the engineers working to pr promote nuclear security on television um, in large campaigns. They were bringing together tech experts um, and platforms for communication that I think at the beginning of the initiative they never could have imagined. Um, and so where I think about where Spark steps in to collaborative impact work as research and evaluators, it's really around three core values. Uh, the first of which is learning and adaptation. As evaluators, we like to say it's not necessarily about all about outcomes, um, it's not about performance. It's always not about impact. A lot of this is about embedding into your work learning and how you're going to do that so that you can rapidly adapt. Um, and so we like to encourage people not to think about hiring an evaluator for their project, but bringing the evaluative thinking skills to the table that you need. And we can build that anywhere. Um, and that's a lot of what we do at Spark. I think the second aspect of our core values is systems thinking. And I think a lot of people can talk about systems in the work, but it's actually really hard to think about systems and who is going to be your partner who is sitting at the table and helping you map those out and think about what those need to look like. Where are the levers that can be pulled? When is the appropriate time to pull those levers? And from where we sit, how are you going to demonstrate to others while you're waiting for all of those results to happen? all of the progress that you've been making and what signals are there. And I think the third, and I'm sure you will hear from far greater experts in this area than us at Spark, is equity. Um, we have really tried to double down our efforts in this space. We've watched a lot of our collaboratives talk about equity at a very surface level, um, maybe even include it in terms of how they disaggregate data, but we are seeing that as much more um, much more of our responsibility as evaluators when we come to the table. How do we set aside our hubris and actually think about and put people in the driver's seat as opposed to proof? And so that's really been where we've been focusing our efforts going forward. Thank you, Laura. Michael? State of the art. Mm -hmm. So, um, good evening. Um, I'm struggling with that question because in some ways I feel like we're not being state-of-the-art. I feel like we're um, not bringing great discipline to this work. And the reason why I say that we're not being state-of-the-art in some cases, and then I'll tell you areas where I do think we're being state-of-the-art. It's hard for me to imagine being state-of-the-art if you're afraid to name your people. If you're afraid to say black folks, poor white folks, poor Asians, poor our struggling 100 million folks in America living at 200 percent of poverty. You can talk all fancy as, as you like about systems and policy and equity. But if you are afraid in your heart to deal with doing the work that the 100 million needs you to do, you're not on the leading edge of anything but maintaining your position. And so I say that because at the same time that we have gotten very sophisticated in how we talk about this work, it's also the very time that I see people still too darn afraid to do the work. 
And yet they're afraid that we have someone like Trump in office, which to many folks is not a surprise, those of us who live with this, because the reality is if our side has been too afraid to own their people, what did you think you would get? Our institutions have failed, folks. So that's why I say I don't know what the leading edge is in some cases because I'm still seeing too much of that institutional resistance to actually want to dive into the work. Now, having said that, I am seeing a lot of good progress. And here's where I see the progress getting to some of the conditions. To me, equity is not a side. Equity is the work. Creating a just and fair society is what we should be in the business to do. The question is, are you doing it with a charity orientation or a transformative orientation? Charity orientation simply says you're doing good work. Let a thousand lights be a thousand lights and no need to really talk about systems, et cetera. What we can do is talk about how much we did and how well we did. And that's okay. But we, what we're, where I see really good work happening there is people are not conflating what that is. Meals on Wheels is Meals on Wheels. It should be quality food delivered on time. God bless. <laughs> and if you want to do transformative work, you would start working with the food system so that food would be affordable, that there wouldn't be food deserts. That's the transformative structural work that needs to happen. I'm seeing leaders in communities um, be on the leading edge when they're very clear about where they're playing. That's one thing. I also see leaders being on the leading edge when they're bringing discipline to the work. Simply showing up and calling meetings and calling that collective impact or change work is really incompetence at its best. If you can't call out the discipline of Six Sigma or results-based accountability or whatever, it's a pity that we have all this student loan debt and have no ability to act. It's tragic that we're going to schools and being educated to know not how to do the work. And so the leading edge is folks actually are bringing that discipline. They can talk about the population, the result, and the ways in which they're going to measure progress. And then they're learning how to craft good strategy. This notion of learning is really powerful. Um, and then lastly, they have people and results at the center. No matter what you do, you can tell whether something is real or not if you just ask people to tell you the people in the place. And so when I talk about the people in the place, the people can actually tell you the number that they're trying to work on. It's a very different conversation to talk about 100 folks versus 100,000. And often, no matter whether we're working on the charity side or the transformative side, we're not clear about who the people are, <laughs> where they live, what they need. So it's really hard for me to think about how do you craft a good emergent strategy when you don't know the basics. So where we are learning about being on the leading edge, it's we're doing these things. We understand our population. We understand what they need. We understand that we need to be able to have good charity infrastructure and simultaneously transform the conditions so that trends on charity is, is not needed as much. And then people are showing up um, being able to take up their own agency. So the self as instrument is really important. That was the last thing I would say, because if you won't show up with the conviction to do this work, the courage to do this work, results won't matter. You will find a way to avoid doing the fundamental work. And the fundamental work is in communities where people are able to ask one simple question. Are, is anyone better off as a result of this? Not how many webinars you did, how many community of practices that you managed, how many conferences you went to. But are the people that you said you wanted to serve actually better off? That's what we're seeing. Great. Thank you, Michael. Jennifer. Great. It's always, always good to follow Michael, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be here, and I am glad to follow Michael. I, I agree uh, with everything that he said when you ask about are we state of the art? I think the way we think about it at Strive Together is actually borrowing from a key tenant of continuous improvement, which is can we, how do we support our network of 70 communities at being the best at getting better? And this work is continually evolving. And um, having been doing this work for more than a decade now and thinking back on how we did the work in Cincinnati when that seminal article about uh, collective impact made it sound a lot easier than it really was. We have evolved this work tremendously and we're still learning and we're definitely learning uh, from uh, the work Michael and others are doing uh, nationally in this field. But I think 
think I'll speak to a couple specific examples. So at Strive Together, we convene a network of 70 partnerships who are, who are bound by two things. Um, first, a common set of outcomes, cradle to career. We have seven outcomes that all of the partnerships in our network agree to track and work on, as well as our theory of action. And I won't get too wonky with you, but our theory of action really builds on many of the principles that Michael just uh, referenced, but really it's starting with that shared community vision and accountability, the focus on data and evidence-based decision-making, the collaborative action is really the third pillar of our work, and that means using the data to dig down into the root cause and really understand what is going on with that data. And this is all types of data, not only the administrative data. This is data that's being collected in the classrooms that can be collected in your community, qualitative data as well as quantitative data. And it requires to do this type of work. It requires the leadership. I'm sure you'll hear us talk about it. It requires infrastructure, so investment in sustainability. Investors have to make an investment in these, this backbone support that can do and support cross-sector partners and communities to do this work. And we believe in that as our, our really the, the foundation for the work that we support across our national network. And going along with that, there are principles uh, that really build on Michael's uh, key, uh, key points that he just made around engaging the community and authentically engaging the community. Paul mentioned uh, an article that I uh, just co-authored with the now current executive director of the Strive Partnership in Cincinnati. And it's really a look back on 10 years of evolution as to how we were defining community engagement at that time which was really, let's go out and have a pizza party and collect some community input and just push our agenda like we were going to anyway, to authentically engaging stakeholders and in, in, in not engaging, but empowering. And empowering is the wrong word, too. I think it's, it's activating. Uh, it's, it's making sure that community members have a, vo have a voice and are part of the co-development of solutions. And so as we evolve the work and work continuously to get to state of the art, we evolve that theory of action. And we just released a new theory of action that guides the work of our, our 70 partnerships. And I was in Portland, Oregon earlier this week. And that's where I, whenever I need to, to uh, you know, some reassuring into one of the, uh, our communities and seeing the example like I saw uh, in changes happening and that we're getting to this systems transformation helps me believe that we're, we're, doing, uh, we're doing good work, we're evolving in the right direction, and I'll, I'll tell that story really quickly here. But um, in Multnomah County, several of the uh, school districts have been working on, uh, they, they noticed looking at their data that they have some challenges around disproportionate discipline. And um, specifically what I, what I was hearing from was, uh, what, I, what I saw in the room in Portland is uh, instructional support specialist together with a community uh, a culturally, a, a leader of a culturally specific organization in the community talking about how they came in and they looked at data and they, they had to look at, at really deep levels of data to understand why were black children being, having greater numbers of discipline referrals than other children? And what time of day was this happening in the, in the school day? And in what, who were the teachers? And what was going on with those certain populations? And getting to that level of data, they were able to very quickly make some changes that didn't cost anything. This is like moving snack time to earlier in the day. Having some, doing some work with teachers, engaging some of these culturally specific organizations who are qualified to work on issues of implicit bias and starting to do work with teachers in, in a way to help support their, what, how they're working with children and, and really work to reduce the uh, disproportionate discipline uh, uh, for black children by 38%. So they, had, they were seeing great results. And while this feels incremental, and sometimes it's hard to kind of see how do you get from incremental to these systems level changes, some very simple institutional policies in that school could, could be made to, to get, get improvement at scale in the school. But then there was the cross-site 
uh, work that happened that was happening across the county in Multnomah County. So then you have a much bigger scale. And then once you start to uncover some of those issues in a community, you can start to see there's some common trends here. There's some themes. What can we do with data to change policies and get better outcomes across the cradle to career continuum? So I, I can't say that we were doing that type of work 10 years ago, but to see the evolution of this work, thanks to the partnership we have with, uh, with PolicyLink and the Promise Neighborhoods Network and, and learning from one another and certainly seeing the evaluation uh, work that's happening, we're really advancing the work and I think we're, we're going we're gonna to get there. So. Great. Thank you. Uh, Laura, can you tell us a little bit more about your study and what were some of the most uh, prominent findings coming out of that? Sure, yep. And I just want to say it's so great to hear leaders talking about data and findings all together in one sentence as, as a way of motivating their strategy and advancing their work. So it's great uh, to Which, incidentally, is a topic that I just as a forewarning that I want to come back to. You know, we're, measuring our, we're measuring the right things. What we measure is what becomes important. We're awash with data. But what are we focused on? And is it the right... Great. topics, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. You've just done a longitudinal study yeah. and we'd love to hear a little more yeah. about it. So Spark and ORS Impact um, were actually brought in by FSG, the Collective Impact Forum, um, and the Aspen Institute to actually respond to what I'm sure many of you have felt or seen in your communities and certainly what we've seen at Spark, which is this consternation around this formal collective impact model. Certainly lots of communities, um, there's a lot within that model that communities want to embrace and take on and carry that credibility and validity forward. At the same time, uh, what we see in here, right, is that, that they want to own their own models and they want to honor what is unique about what each of their communities are doing. Running alongside of that, um, there's been a lot of, of embracing of collective impact, the formal collective impact, without a whole lot of evidence to understand exactly how the model works and when it works and, and why. Um, so Spark was brought in with ORS to begin to design a study that would allow us to provide some of that evidence base and understand where to go from there. So, so we spent um, some time looking at 25 initiatives um, across the United States and Canada, multiple regions, multiple geographies, some rural, some urban. Um, most had been around for at least three years and one of the requirements was that they had to be looking at what were those core conditions of collective impact, backbone, shared measurement, mutually reinforcing activities, communication, and now that I'm sitting up here, I'm going to forget what my last one was, um, which is that common agenda or common vision. Um, and, and, and so we documented, we went into each of these communities, we visited some in depth, um, some we just collected some data from as well, and, and there was a lot that we found within the course of this study. Um, in fact, one of the key things is collective impact does does contribute to change, and there is evidence that it both allows communities to expand critical programs and services through the collective frame, and it creates systems change. However, we also found that collective impact on its own is not the only way these changes are produced. Um, and so they could play a catalyzing role within communities, but collective impact in and of itself is not the panacea for all of the hard work that has to happen. Um, some of the other things we looked at and found um, is that we, we present these core conditions as though they are on a level plane. They are not on a level plane. Some of them are more critical than others, and, and some of them were talked about here as being absolutely important, which is that backbone support. The backbone support, in fact, um, allows things like mutually reinforcing activities, shared measurement, and community communication to actually emerge within the collective impact effort. So without that that element and that aspect of the work, it's very, it's very hard to build it and move forward. Um, tied to that strongly is the leadership and the coordination and facilitation that happens at the backbone level. Uh, shared measurement um, is another aspect of collective impact that was looked at closely within the study. It was the one thing that was not consistently implemented across collective impact sites, but where it was implemented, and again, as you heard, that was uh, a critical factor in helping communities articulate the work they were doing and advancing those outcomes and moving forward. Um, the kind of, the last aspect we looked at was this equity in, 
aspect. Um, and again, that is another one that varies across sites. It's not a core condition of collective impact, but as you mentioned, it is the reason the work is being done. Um, and where implementation of equity was intentional. It wasn't just passing, it wasn't just about disaggregating data. They were able to see stronger results and actually advance equitable, equitable outcomes in their communities. Um, one interesting aspect of the work that we still have to understand and explore is that in more recent collective impact efforts, where equity was being implemented, it was not being implemented as effectively or showing as many results. We don't know why that's the case, but the newer, the newer collective impact efforts are not doing as well in terms of implementing equity. Um, we frame the initiative for various audiences, and I'm sure some of the questions will help us explore um, what we've seen in terms of implications for them. But, but a lot of what we've learned um, from this study first starts um, with laying good foundations for collective impact if you want to be successful. Again, going back to that backbone support. Um, and there are many ways to engage policy, not just big policy changes. Um, and so how you are working both informally and formally together within your community to pull policy levers, not just at the legislative level, but in terms of organization, are absolutely critical to collective impact outcomes. Um, and those don't have to be levers that are pulled across multiple organizations. Individual organizations within the collective impact effort can make policy and practice changes in how they do their work that will lead to additional outcomes. Be patient, um, and I know that this is a hard one, especially working with the groups who were here this week. Um, but the collective impact efforts we looked at were in operation for four to 24 years. Those that were under seven years were still in their infancy in terms of, of leading to outcomes. So this is long work um, and that you need to be patient in doing that. And hopefully that provides some credibility and validity when you're approaching funders and they're saying, hey, where's my outcomes? You're able to say that, that, that we've looked at this and this is tough. Um, and, and again, as I said, we don't know everything. There's a lot to learn coming out of the collective impact work. Uh, and the study is up there for those who want to take a look at it and dive a little bit deeper into those. Great. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Mike, I'm going to invite you to push us a little harder on our equity thinking. Um, as you know, one of the prominent criticisms of collective impact work is that it, it, uh, it can, in some instances, reinforce existing power dynamics <coughs> in communities and uh, exclude uh, the very vulnerable populations that it's designed to serve from taking a meaningful part in the decision-making process. So I wanted to ask you uh, your thoughts about um, who should be at the table, really, and how do you um, balance off needs for efficiency as against needs for representation and participation? Mm -hmm. um, I don't try to balance efficiency because I know that whether you do it in the first day or the tenth year, the community will move when it's ready. So the question is, when will you learn that? <laughs> um, the, so for me, I start by making sure that I'm clear about how I'm showing up. My consciousness. Do I actually want to work with community? See, in many cases, that's not our intention. So this is why we can't find folks. This is why it takes so long. All those work avoidance things that you hear, which are really excuses that in most environments you'd be fired for, right? You're not getting beyond. Um, they are really because we're scared of each other. You know, I don't know how you work with community if you're afraid of them. Like people can't sense that on you, right? And so a lot of the stuff that breaks down around equity breaks down because of our orientation to how we see folks. We see them as less than, we don't see them as capable. And while people don't have to say some stuff, people of color walk through the world highly intuitive. That's how you learn to survive. So you can experience that, you know. And so, you know, you wonder why people aren't coming to your meetings. They know that you really don't value their insight. <laughs> they know that you're gonna move your agenda anyway. And you know, the evolution of collective impact was really powerful, and I, I applaud FSG because a few years in, they were getting this critique, and they came to us, and, you know, uh, the former president and CEO of PolicyLink said something in the meeting. She says, as only as gracefully as she can, she says, if you're not doing equity work, what are you doing with collective impact? And that was a powerful moment in that session because what it said was, 
that top-down elite white orientation where whiteness is centered over everything else meant that we weren't dealing with equity. We were dealing with what civic elites wanted to do at a particular time. And I'm saying that, and I could just as easily say it about black folks or anyone else who's in charge. Your consciousness is important about how you show up because just because you're of color doesn't mean you're going to advance equity. But given the orientation of our society, whiteness is what's centered. And so it's dangerous when that's what's centered because it doesn't often allow for other things to be centered. That's why I said I center people and results. But you also then have to be willing to show up a particular way. I don't show up trying to be your friend. I'm not show, showing up worried about whether you're going to be uncomfortable or not. If we're doing the right work, we are going to be uncomfortable. We're going to be scared. It's going to be tough. And quite frankly, institutions will be upset. Folks, equity requires that you acknowledge the structural problems that still persist today. And too often in these equity initiatives, what gets delayed is their acknowledgement of that. So you're talking about a population level result and you think you're going to solve it by just doing charity work. I'll do this little reading program. Won't deal with the school or whatever. You know, that's fantasy. So equity isn't working in a lot of places because it was never in the heart of the leaders who were starting on this journey. And that is the biggest problem. That's why I said I'm so frustrated in our sector when we think about where is the shining light. Because if you think about it, it's taken us 20 years to get equity to be ubiquitous in civil society. Think about that for a moment. So I'm often surprised when people have the audacity to talk about how fast will we get results when they actually haven't even shown the stomach to actually want to do the darn work. They haven't even earned that right to ask that question. And we fall into that trap all the time. Oh, I'll do it in two years. I'll do it in three years. If you really are, you are going to break a whole lot of stuff in community because it needs to be broken. And so this is what I'm struggling with with equity right now because so many places are not actually centering people in place. They're centering whiteness. And when whiteness gets centered, it sounds like this. Um, well, you know, if we do that, that person won't be comfortable. Our funder might not like that. I don't know if we can do that. That's not on the civic agenda right now. I don't know if we can say race. I don't know if we can name a thing a thing. That's centering whiteness. And I think about it because now that I'm not white and I'm in a place of privilege, I could easily do the same thing. So please don't hear that as a one-way street. Equity should start with us in our own organizations, for those of us with agency, making decisions. And I say this with deep love in my heart, because the reality is right now a policy link. I can make any decision I want. I can choose to hire Native Americans. I can choose to hire returning citizens. Or I could just choose to hire from the best schools in the country and act like that's equity. That's not equity, folks. And here's the bigger reality. I don't have to get it to lead on equity. Women shouldn't have to wait for me to get it if I don't get it about paying them fairly. My LGBTQ brothers and sisters shouldn't have to wait for me to get it to feel safe at work and be able to walk over that threshold and bring their full selves. The reality now about equity is this. If you don't get it, your job is to get out of the way. That is actually your job. Because you can't hold results and you don't get it. Because we're waiting until you get it before we can get to work. And that's what's not being said in community. The thing that's holding us up is whatever is centered. If it's black leadership, if it's white leadership, if it's Latino leadership, being centered and not being focused on equity. So what I'm asking you to consider is if you don't want to do the work, you got to stop talking about the results because you're giving your political opposition the ammunition to say, see, they spent all that money and it didn't work. And the reality is, yeah, we spent a lot of money, but we spent a lot of money to do charity work. We never spent money to actually get out of the problems that we've created. And the sad thing about all of this that I'm so frustrated that my white brothers and sisters don't get it, get, is that at this very moment where equity is the work, I'm not actually worried about people of color, even though there's great pain in our communities, because we know how to survive. The reality right now is this world is too toxic for white folks, and you see that in the diseases of despair um, data. White America now 
is struggling the same way everybody else is. You can't live in this society now and turn your head. Because in a place like I live in San Francisco, there's no middle class. It's a beautiful example of pushing everybody out. <laughs> and you have to make a choice. Can you afford that private school and your pretty condo or home? No, you can't because you neglected the public education infrastructure. So the reality is this. Our, our desire to not deal with equity now has a world where there's too much pain for everybody. And the sad thing is my white brothers and sisters think actually that black folks and Latinos had something to do with that. This is the world that you created. <laughs> Sit with that for a moment. The last thing I'll say is I often say that when I'm in places where I know where people will immediately go to personal responsibility in those things. And I say to them, you know, we actually heard you when you said personal responsibility. We've been doing it. That's why black women are the most educated group in America right now. But you, on the other hand, didn't do it. You sat in these small towns. You got rid of your daddy's union. You got rid of um, quality education. And now you're sitting in a place that has no opportunity. And you're mad at the world without ever wanting to own. But this is what you said you wanted. Folks, we've got to call it now. Because we've got exactly what we've wanted. And now many of us want to cry about it because it hurts. I just say deal with it. And so if we're going to deal with equity right now, you got to get clear about calling results in this collective impact work or place-based work, whatever you want to do. Because if you don't deal with the structural stuff right now, there is nothing that you're going to do on the programmatic side of the house that is going to stem the tide of the pain that we are seeing in this nation. And so the sad thing is, all the easy stuff has been done. I think it's a great thing, because this is a time for great leadership. So if you ever wanted it, you get it now. But you got to be willing to get focused on what does it mean to do equity work? And what does it mean to do work that is embodied in the word collective impact? Which to me is results at scale. All right. <laughs> That's a lot to think about. <laughs> but thank you. We appreciate it. Be welcome. Um, Jennifer, so I'm going to give you, I was going to ask you another question, but I'm going to give you a chance to react to the kind of things Michael just was talking about. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there are a number of points of entry yeah. here. Could be the original question, which was who should be at the table? Should be this balance, uh, could be this balance between charity work and transformative work. I mean, you run a network and you're uh, focused, as we heard from your earlier comments, on these issues of equity. But how do you lead and uh, how do you grapple with or engage with some of the challenging issues that Michael's raised for us? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's, and we've been having a lot of conversations about this. Um, and it's, it's. Uh, I think when I think back to actually building on the original question is how do we lead? We put our network members in a position to lead and, and really this is the beauty of a network is they can push one another. I mean, we're holding equity. We just, I mentioned our theory of action. We just revised our theory of action and, and really lifted up how we're talking about equity in a much different way. And it's in what one of my colleagues talks about it as, as making equity a verb. And what we were looking at before is the elimination of disparities. In fact, I think back, um, I was just talking with someone about this five years ago. We, we had a task force on the elimination of disparities in student outcomes. And we're really focused on, on the programmatic aspects that could get to eliminating disparities, but not the structural inequities. And, and really, I think that's the evolution of collective impact has been to, to look at our work has always been about systems, but if we're not looking at how to shift power and where, where the community comes in and how you're authentically engaging them, so those are some other changes in our theory of action, but this is what guides the work of our 70 partnerships. And so we work together with the network, with our network of communities, and some are much farther along the continuum on holding equity, naming race, knowing their number than others are. And so the beauty of having a network is you're putting peer together so that they can learn from one another and there's some healthy competition there as well it's like if if I can if if we're holding now raising the bar again which is what we're doing with our our new theory of action so the, actually I can name a, a very specific example of this is 
How we measure progress within our, our 70 network members is, is each network member participates in an annual assessment process where they assess themselves against the theory of action. And um, when, and they, essentially what partnerships are trying to get to, this sort of North Star we had in, in our network was, is, and it still is a North Star for some partnerships, but it's, it's called proof point. And proof point means you have demonstrated uh, that you have at least 60% of your outcomes, or, or, I'm sorry, 60% of indicators across those seven outcome areas that I mentioned, trending positively, and that you have examples of systems change. So this could be uh, institutional policy change, big P policy change, um, systems change could be behavior, investor behavior change in the community. And what we failed to do when we named that first sort of benchmark is we didn't name, we didn't specifically call out D elimination of disparities and working on systemic inequities and changing and shifting power structures in communities. So we raised the bar again. In the network, when I say we, I, I exist to facilitate this network of incredibly amazing people who are doing the work on the ground in 70 communities. And that's what the 30 of us at Strive Together, that's what we're really working to do is how do we pull enough knowledge? Laura mentioned kind of pooling learning and knowledge out of uh, these collective impact initiatives. How do we capture that learning, see what's happening happening on the ground, and then put in place the tools, the systems and structures to support those network members to advance the work on the ground. And so it was the network that helped us reformulate our, our, our new strategic plan, build our new strategic plan, revise this theory of action, and now we have a new North Star, and it's called systems transformation. And it really gets to holding equity as the work and, and seeing systems transform, which might mean that exist, existing systems, which we all know, they get the results that they're designed to, to get. So, so every system that we have currently, we don't like the results we see. Well, they're perfectly designed to get those results. And as Michael said, we have designed those systems. So how do we break down those systems and create new systems? And it starts with some of the, the, the what might seem incremental examples that I described, like what's happening in Portland around disproportionate discipline. And then you start to see those patterns and you start to talk, if you have community engaged and activated, they see that, that makes them angry. Why is my child being disciplined more than other children? Why? What's going on here? And builds this awareness that you can actually change the system. And we're seeing that. So we have results. I know, uh, Laura, you also mentioned it takes some time to get to results and to see outcomes improve. And, and I, I would say in our network, we do we have, we have 10 partnerships who have reached that proof point uh, uh, milestone of, of seeing at least 60% of indicators trending positively and examples of system, systems change. And these are big policy changes in Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio. They have passed universal pre-K as a result of the collective impact efforts and the engagement of community in those, in those communities. So you're seeing these types of systems change happen. And there are, very, there are really clear examples of, of the elimination of disparities in, in Tacoma, where they have raised their gradu high school graduation rate. They were one of the original dropout factories at, at like 55 percent um, high school graduation and they're now up to like 86% and rising in Tacoma Public Schools. But if you dig deeper into that data, you can see that African-American students' uh, graduate high school graduation rates are increasing even at, at a farther pace than other populations. So you can see the elimination of disparities begin to happen and look at some of the systems and structures that have changed and, and look at that and how to scale that. And I think that's the beauty of the network and that's how we're going to get to what we want to see as it relates to equity being the work in, in our space in the Strive Together network. Paul, may I just say one thing? Please. Um, since I didn't answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> the majority of people living in poverty work two jobs. We're the ones who are privileged actually to sit at these tables. So our job is actually to listen and to bring that voice, wisdom, and experience from community into the room. You're taxing people who are already burdened and then you don't even want to listen to them. That is so disrespectful. And so if you have power, stop acting like you don't have it. That's not the bad thing, whether you're white, black, or whatever. Own it. Step into it and use it. And don't hide behind or have to have community here. It's what community wants. At PolicyLink, our job is to respect community, but also to show up with our expertise and put it in the room. To push back into debate, just like we would in any other room. Community doesn't always have it right, just like we don't always have it right. And it doesn't mean we're not in a relationship that way. That makes us in a strong relationship. So I'm simply sharing that, you know what? 
I don't need, if I'm, if I'm already connected to a community, I don't always need community to be at every meeting. But when I'm making important decisions, I should darn well make sure that it has been designed with what we know as the user experience. The same way Porsche does for me, the same way Apple does for me. There's a whole lot of data we could collect. And quite frankly, you could pull any of the last 20 reports done in community, and community's already told you what to do. So the question now is, will you do your damn job? That is the question because we're being paid. We have the privilege to work. So we should do our jobs. Fair enough. That you both touched on a, a challenge that I wanted to get to, which is we, you know, we've talked a lot about results, talked about outcomes. In fact, the title of this session has to do with outcomes for children. Each of you have your own um, sort of rubrics for the way in which you look at results and measure progress. And Jennifer, you were just describing uh, what you do. And Laura, you've looked at this, this whole issue of results. But I guess I want to raise the broader question of are we measuring the right things? You've talked about some qualitative things. You've talked about some things with respect to process and change and transformation, which are more difficult from a sort of technical measurement standpoint to, to point to than some of the other you know, seven-point mm. indicators, and we've got quantitative data to go along with them. Are we measuring the right thing, and where do we need to enhance our capacity to assess, evaluate, and, and arrive at uh, the kinds of evidence that will be persuasive for others who we want to persuade to come into this movement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, the way that I would respond to that question is that I think we, when you have the right people in the room, when you, you have the right people in the room, you can figure out what needs to be measured and, and figure out how to measure it. So I, I don't think, I think the way that our work around measurement has evolved is uh, really the the, the way we are working with communities to do the, to get the types of results I, I described is we have a methodology. It's our improvement methodology, and it is grounded in you know you need to have the administrative data that I talked about. So to do continuous improvement work, but you also have to have that qualitative data. And we're finding ways to get qualitative data in communities by bringing the right people to the table and, and engaging human-centered design and design thinking, which is another piece of of, of this approach, and then the the other, the most important piece, and this is what I was I was jump, trying to get uh, get in before you asked that question to respond to something I was hearing from Michael too, is is leadership and looking at leadership in a different way because I think that's what I I hear here in a lot of how you're thinking about this work, and I know we share similar frameworks in, in working with the Annie Casey Foundation and their results count leadership, results based leadership work, is that uh, really in, you know taking a step back as as a leader and 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 not you know kind of facilitating getting the data and the information from the experts and facilitating a process to get to those that data and to get to the root cause and so data may not look like spreadsheets <laughs> data is is really what uh, what is the qualitative data how do you go out and talk to parents about what's happening how do you go and engage with other sectors I mean we're talking about education here but it, it really is if you want to move education Education outcomes, and you all know this, you have to look across at different sectors, what we call adjacent sectors, health outcomes, transportation outcomes have an influence, public safety, justice outcomes, how are these influencing education outcomes? So I think it's evolved. I think um, I think we can get a lot of those data sets, those administrative data sets from cities, county government, uh, school districts, and then you have to couple that together with the qualitative data, the community expertise. And, and really look at that and triangulate it with the, uh, the national evidence base is, is how we talk about doing it. And, and I do think we know the right data. It's just whether or not we have the leadership, the right leadership to, to look at data in that way in community and if we are willing to take the time and do the hard work because it's really easy to get the administrative data and just take it and say this is what data can lie. You can lie with data uh, uh, very easily. So well, I, What I, I'm yeah. curious about, because you both run networks, is – yeah, this sort of tight loose. You're clear on what you want to achieve, but you're loose and respectful of community in terms of how to get there. So how do you strike the balance between standardizing what you expect because you need to develop evidence and proof points and make a case and being respectful of the community, as you were arguing um, earlier, Michael, and saying, well, you know, the community will move when it wants to move. The community will move in the directions that it 
feels it needs to move in, uh, that could be let a, fly, a thousand flowers bloom. Everybody's going to be doing their own thing, and you won't be able to get any sort of compositive uh, set of indicators that you could then push, you know, greater investment in the strategy with. I'll share something, but I thought you were going to raise something. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep. So this is where I think we've made a great deal of progress in the field by setting what we would call setting the container to get results. Mm -hmm. So like when you set the container to get results, people are coming because they're clearing the population to result in the indicator. So when I'm talking about pushing on what works, having debates around strategy should be robust and dynamic, and that's where we can argue and fuss and fight with each other. Um, but even with the results and indicators, the community will tell me where they want to start. And I can bring my expertise around what are the best ways to use data to measure that. So an example is, I bring my expertise. What do you want to do, community if it's housing or childcare, whatever? Tell me what you want to do. Then we can show up with our expertise. These are the best metrics out there. This is where we have data today. This is where we don't. That's what they would expect when I say do our jobs. And then we can have a robust debate about strategy, because even if it's evidence-based, it does not mean it'll work in a particular place. So. It is not a thousand flowers bloom because that container is tight. So the price of admission to a meeting is that you actually want to put a contribution on the table in service of an indicator. That's the work. So the most elegant and beautiful thing a leader can do is align contribution in service of an indicator. So one of the standards that we put out explicitly in community for everyone is if we're doing Promise Neighborhoods work, you do not come in the room if you don't own a contribution. Because if we let you do that, community will argue about for the last 20 years how they've been screwed over. Nonprofits will argue about this is all I got money to do, et cetera. We will end up never getting to the work. So studying the container, that's where we've made a leap in the field in terms of the discipline, um, allows us then to flow with folks around things that should be dynamic, like strategy, like learning. Fair enough. Laura. Yeah, I mean, I think I would um, agree with everything that's been said, and I, I, I think, you know, from where we sit, I feel that um, we have more than enough capacity to collect data on results and to measure results. I think there is an abundance of data out there, almost to the point that we don't know how to use it. Um, I, I think reflecting back on the equity conversation and personal responsibility, and I, I think about our roles as evaluators and researchers, um, what we have really been struggling with is how to bring an equitable approach to evaluation into the work and being sure that what we're measuring isn't only what the institution has designated the results should be um, or what the funder has designated the results should be, but what data are we collecting that actually reflects what the results of the people want and need on the ground. And, and so when you say, are we measuring the right things, I think the question is, who's asking us to measure and what are they asking us to measure? And so I think those right things vary um, by audience for sure, and we tend to measure and defer to the funder mm -hmm. um, and to the organization standard and criteria in terms of what we measure. And, and I think we, we forget often um, to measure some of those things that are most important um, in, in demonstrating that we've achieved equity and, and what is the experience that people are having. I, I don't think we place enough emphasis on how we collect stories, how we collect narratives, mm -hmm. um, and then from an evaluation perspective, how we aggregate those into something meaningful that actually demonstrates that we see changes in community. Good. Fair enough. Okay, I want to do a quick lightning round because I got two more topics I want to introduce, but I want within five minutes to get to our audience and give the audience a chance to raise questions. So think about your own questions, and I do mean questions, and they're going to be microphones, and you can come up to the microphones and ask a question in a moment. So the two topics, one that I wanted to ask is, is this work a different in rural context? How should we be thinking about that? What is your experience? Um, any comments on, you know, a lot of our, including our own institution here, tilts toward an urban bias in thinking about education challenges and things of this nature. And we, I think, have seen some of the results of kind of ignoring the rural uh, communities in our country in recent years and in election results and things of that nature. So what ought we to be thinking about with rural communities in mind as we talk about collaborative action? I know it's a big topic, but we've got to do short answers, but 
I could jump in really quick just on a couple of challenges we see in the rural communities that we work with that tie to this data question, one of which is they don't have the resources and the data to actually contextualize and understand their work and the need. Um, and often That's what you found that is what we have found in some of the rural communities in terms of how do we measure our results and access some of these larger data sets that don't exist. Um, and, and I think also um, do they have all of the infrastructure and resources that they need to pool in the types of expertise that will actually help them advance the work as they they go forward, whether it's community academic partnerships, um, whether it's particular skill sets that need to be brought in to help lift a strategy up off the ground, um, but how do they actually access some of the policy system work that they need to be able to do when they're out in rural communities um, and really trying to bring those voices authentically to the policy table. Great. Anything else to add? I think I, I just would echo the policy focus uh, because you don't have, I mean, what Laura said is, is what we found it, is that without the abundance of, of nonprofit organizations and partners with the schools, it really is relying on uh, the, the um, county and, and state sort of funding streams and influencing policy in that way. We have, uh, actually, it's a promised neighborhood um, in Berea, Kentucky, that is, is helping us think about how our theory of action could or could, needs to be, uh, you know, modified to better support rural communities because I don't think it's been designed for that way. The majority of our partnerships are not rural, but I do believe that there's a way to do this work and certainly learning from a very successful initiative in Kentucky is, is a good start. Okay. Last question. Elected officials, mayors, county officials, what's the appropriate role for elected officials in this kind of work? I would say in some cases it is to um, put the call to action out there. It is to structure their capital in service of this. In many cases, if they saw their job as building communities of opportunity, we wouldn't even have to talk about a program. Mm -hmm. We would be talking about how do you have institutions that have raised their capacity to really be of service. That is, I think, the real opportunity for elected leaders like mayors to see the actual system, see the system of oppression, see the system of a community of opportunity, and continually and call the community to make tweaks to it. Mm -hmm. And to stop fetishizing business and allowing business to cause great harm and then ask the nonprofit sector to clean it up. <laughs> I mean, you see that happening all over the place where corporations, I mean, you know, a good example is Flint as just one example where we think giving water bottles to folks is actually good practice. No, we're still poisoning kids right now, right? So we're, we're throwing out all of our brain development work right now because of what we know happens with lead-based paint. So that is an example there where if you don't see the system and deal with the system issues, you end, it ends up undercutting all your other work. So what we need now today are mayors who actually see building communities of opportunity as their charge. Mm -hmm. Good. I think that's a good place to stop, and I think uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll endorse that wholeheartedly. <laughs> okay, if, uh, are there folks in the audience who have questions uh, for any of our panelists? We've uh, touched the surface, scratched the surface of a very complicated topic, and we'd love to have your input. <laughs> we have the opportunity. We have the opportunity for people online to submit questions as well. We'd be happy to take those. Hi. Yeah, please identify yourself oh. and uh, phrase your question. Okay, my name is Abby Cohen, and I went to the Ed School last year. Um, and I actually had a conversation with Professor Revel about this in the fall, about. Um, kind of like the saturation of education nonprofits that exist in um, connection with school districts. And something that I came to the Ed School to study and am currently working on is finding ways that we can have, and I think Professor Revel said this well in a metaphor about flower shops on different blocks and how they don't actually talk to each other, but they have the same passion of selling flowers. And I think that can be said similarly to education nonprofits that have amazing vision, center equity, but don't talk to each other. So in the community of Cambridge, the community I grew up with and went to school in, 
I see that similarly where I see there's so many amazing organizations that are doing such great work that center equity, yet we still have the same gaps um, in achievement among race, how many ways you want to measure it. Um, and we have so much resources, so many resources that are poured into it, including at a university like this. So I guess I wonder, starting it with something in striving for a collective impact, how do you get there when on the ground you're not talking to each other? Like, what are the first steps among nonprofits to be able to center this work that's so important to hear each other and then be able to be able to sit at the table with policymaker, excuse me, policymakers and students and whoever else should be there? Um, so I don't know if that was very clear. I have a lot kind of going through my mind, but I guess what I'm trying to ask is, how do you begin to do collective impact when the on the ground makers aren't talking to each other? Well, quickly, I'll just say they don't talk to each other because they're not capitalized to do so. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, this is the problem when you don't ask the question, have you structured an ecosystem to win on the results that you want versus to just finance a bunch of activity that is just random? And that is the problem. And the danger is we can't actually say because we've spent so much money, we should get X result because we've never structured ourselves to win. We've structured ourselves to be busy doing individualized activity. And I, the only thing that I would add to that, because I completely agree, I, I think, um, you know, I think investors or funders who are, who are uh, investing in, in many of these nonprofits are held responsibility for this. But I, I do think with any, to start any collective impact or collaborative action work, the first thing that you have to do is agree to share accountability for results. And so getting nonprofits in the room and, I, you know, they aren't incentivized to talk to one another, which is why so many uh, collective impact initiatives do start with a funder who has sprayed and prayed, like sprayed all their resources, prayed for some outcomes and aren't seeing outcomes, starts to think, well, we need to take a different approach. So bringing those partners together and incentivizing them to talk to one another, to look at their data, to put results at the center. If they're in, and I believe, and I, we experience in community, that nonprofit organizations do uh, want to see results. They are holding equity at the center of their work, and so they can be a, an important part of, of the equation if they're incentivized to do that. Thank you. Hi, this is for Laura. Um, I was just wondering what the equity that you, you refer to the uh, result, the equity results in your in your data, and that um, you, I was just wondering what results or criteria were you using, and what you didn't see in the data that you were hoping to see uh, in relation to um, shifts in that, uh, or addressing equity or solving equity. Yeah, so I, I could talk a little bit about how the study was put together in terms of when we went into the communities, um, we didn't look at all of the communities for equity, we looked at, at a portion of those. Um, the, methodologically, they designed a rubric looking at kind of three aspects of equity, one of which was, is there capacity um, to actually take action on equity within the community, is there commitment towards equity at, at kind of that base level. And then the third is, are they actually seeing equity results? And um, what we saw um, in particular is that the stronger the implementation of the collective impact effort was, and the greater, um, the, the more consistent implementation across those core criteria, the, the farther along the organization was going to be in it, not only its commitment to equity, but its capacity to take action on equity and then results. And so um, looking across, I, I can't remember offhand exactly how many sites they looked across. I want to say it was like 15 um, that those sites that did not have um, consistent implementation across four or more of those core collective conditions um, were less likely to lead towards those so equity results. Small, yeah. When you're looking for capacity, what are, you, what are the things that you're looking at for capacity? I, I what are the criteria for capacity to address equity? Yeah, you know, um, I'm going to speak kind of broadly because I don't have the specifics of that full rubric in front of me. I think we looked a lot. Um, I think they looked at intentionality and ability to use and dissect data 
and understand how that data was at play. Um, I think we looked at the representation of community and equitable leadership um, within the collective impact itself and how that reflected uh, what the community effort and population results were that they were attempting to achieve. Um, they looked at whether there was actual intentional strategy within their theory of action that was designed to get to equitable results and to focus equity within the effort. And I'm sure there are some other things within there um, that were there as well. That is one of the aspects of the study that um, we are getting a lot of traction on in terms of being able to refine this equity rubric and help understand at a deeper level exactly what that looks like from a collective impact perspective from leadership and governance to shared vision and all the way down through shared measurement. Okay, thank you. We'll go over here. Yes, thank you. Good evening. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Jerome Underwood. I'm President and CEO of Action for a Better Community in Rochester, New York. We are uh, a community action agency, a network, uh, part of the community action network in the country. However, I'm here this week uh, as part of the Strive Network and the Rock the Future Network, our alliance leaders here. Uh, so Michael, you said some things that really, really resonated with me. So my, my question, um, mainly for Jennifer though, but for the entire panel, um, a lot of our work, um, we know that in order to comfort the afflicted, we have to afflict the comfortable. So when we talk about, and Michael in particular, you said you got to call it what it is, and because we know we're talking about, we're activated, we're ready to go home and do some work. Well, we know that that work is going to piss off a lot of white people, right? And when I say that, I mean like deliberately saying that part of this work is, is, is letting go of some power or a lot of it. And that, to me, seems to scare white people, right? So my question is about, um, and it's been written about white fragility. And Jennifer, you've done a lot of work in the network, um, and but that seems to be very resilient. You know, the ability of white people, like, oh, only so far. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about, you know, what that, you know, as walking around in the skin that you're walking around in and how you challenge that mm -hmm. and, and how you interpret the necessity um, literally to give up trust so that people who live in these communities, mm -hmm. right, okay. some of that power can be transferred to them to do the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. And um, I think, uh, so I can say, for me um, and for the organization, and I heard Michael say this, and um, you know, and we've talked about policy links uh, work. We're really working. So, me personally, I'm working on my own personal equity journey. Uh, as is everyone on our team, we've engaged uh, an organization to help us with this because we know to lead this work or to support, to lead lead and in, in, in really facilitate this work across the network that we're going to need to build our own capability and I'm, I'm working to build my own capability and I will say that um, white fragility personally for me um, has has resonated a lot. I've, I've been on this journey, I, I uh, reflected on this earlier this year um, in a piece that I wrote about learning in public with um, a number of network members who are farther along on their journey than I am and um, having to kind of come to terms with that and and being in a space with our team where I hope that I can get to a point and I, I know that I'm confident that we will get to a point where I think policy link is and we were just at a recent forum together where I was able to hear about policy links organizational transformation because I think I hope this uh, answers your question Jerome but this is how I was hearing it is we have to do our own work personally and organizationally and then with the network and we're we're, getting, we're moving into a next phase of work with uh, the partner we're working with to work together with the network. And um, it's, it's a journey and it is going to be painful. It makes a lot of people uncomfortable. I have been uncomfortable and that means that I'm growing and learning. And so I guess every time that I'm uncomfortable and to, sit, you know, to, to fully admit that um, I'm uncomfortable a lot and that is good. And it feels good to, to be able to, um, to know that, yeah, I'm on the journey, I guess. So I don't know that that was, uh, uh, that's, that's just where I am, <laughs> so. Now one thing I will add to this is that, you know, in some cases for the rest of us who are of color, 
it is time to straighten your back up and stop being afraid. Um, and you must be willing to suffer loss. That just goes with it. So you got to decide, this is why I said use yourself as an instrument. You got to decide how you want to relate to power. I don't choose to cower to it. I don't know, you don't get anything for that anyway. So, or if you do, it's not at the scale that I need it to be. So I'm going to go out one way or the other. I'm going to go out on my own terms. And I think when you are leading in the privileged positions we are, you no longer have the luxury to be worried about how you feel about it. You need to do what the leadership task is. And so I'm sharing that to say I see too many of us of color in rooms, whether it's the White House or Congress or whatever, and we're more worried about being liked or too timid to say what needs to be said. And then we go out in the parking lot and we got so much to say. And we're so tough. Or we get on Twitter and we're so strong. No, you need to do the darn work. And by doing the darn work, it means you got to show up a particular way. And that may mean you don't get invited to some places. And that's okay, because a lot of those places aren't results-based work anyway. <laughs> so they really, it's a great screen. <laughs> But I'm just sharing that because we all have to do our work. Because in some cases, I found the black community to be the biggest barrier to me getting results because of our own politics. And so I'm just saying that. So no matter where the power sits in a place, you've got to be willing to decide how you want to show up and relate to it. OK, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Maria Cavildo, and I'm actually, this is my first day, first time ever at the Graduate School of Education. I'm a Loeb Fellow over at the Graduate School of Design. And uh, a long time ago, I was one of the people that founded Promesa Boyle Heights, which is a collective impact project in Boyle Heights, in the neighborhood where I was born and raised. And um, they've just done amazing work. I was able to meet with educators this summer. And the thing is, at the same time that this amazing work has happened for families, for youth, families are getting displaced because of gentrification. And that's something I'm just really concerned about because I put so much of my life into that community, these residents, I mean, the, the residents are the backbone of that, that collective impact project. And I'm wondering, like, in the country, are there models, are there um, our, I guess models that we can look to for how we can keep our same neighbors um, so that they can benefit from all of this work, you know, all of the tenacity. And I guess that's my curiosity as an urban planner, as an urbanist, uh, someone who's involved more in economic development and community development work versus education is like, what contribution do we make to keeping these neighbors that have made this investment through this collective impact work? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, so in terms of pointing to good examples of how this is working, I don't have them, but I do know that what has been an important uh, evolution of our, our work and how we're supporting communities is building on some examples in uh, South King County in Seattle who has had the housing authority, the local housing authority as part of their collective impact partnership and really thinking about housing and gentrification that's happening in, in Seattle and homelessness as, as a key concern also, but it's it's thinking about how do you engage those sectors and have them at the table and, and show in, in South King County and other communities who have brought housing to the table because they're seeing that the mobility has a tremendous impact on student outcomes. And so when families are displaced, as you said, it's it's having this incredible impact that is, is, is really an economic issue. And so having housing there at the table to think about this with them is, I think, a, a good practice, and I know that there, there there could be some examples that I'm not aware of, but yeah. Yeah, I would add um, just some examples of places we've worked with um, have been largely coastal communities. Oakland is one of those, San Diego is another, where it's also bringing environmental justice <laughs> groups to the table who are actually also closely um, working with housing authorities and housing groups to con and displacement to understand how we can keep people in homes that are affordable within their neighborhoods 
benefits um, and, and thinking about it from a multiple systems yeah. perspective. It's not just educational mm -hmm. outcomes or health outcomes, but environmental outcomes as well. And I'll just share, the um, cities are using their community development block grant dollars and their home investment partnership dollars um, to prioritize neighborhoods as a way to stem gentrification. Um, but this is an example of what I mean by charity versus transformation. If you keep writing the report, you're already 10 to 20 years too late. So if you don't own the land, or you're not going to align the cap structure the capital so that you can build new units yourself, everything else you do is just avoiding the inevitable and you're not going to stop it. And see, that's what we need to say to funders, is that if you don't own the land, if you're not going to create your own financing instruments, you can't stop gentrification. And so this is an example where we play around the edges. Oh, let's write a report about what people need. Let's write a report about the conditions. Those two or three years are critical because right now you get to see another example where this is going to happen. Opportunity zones is another example because you notice opportunity zones has no protections for people in place. Mm -hmm. And so somehow magically now the nature and logic of capitalism is going to be loving. Mm -hmm. I don't get that when developers are already trying to figure out how to make their billions. And so this is another example where public policy got implemented, has none of our stuff in it, and now we're all scrambling trying to figure out how we're going to clean it up. So unless you're ready to fight right now, I don't know what you're going to do about opportunity zones, because deals are already starting to get made. People are already starting to figure out how to do that. But that is an example right there where under the veil of opportunity, we're going to really push a whole lot of folks out. You know, I just, I just want to pick up on that a little bit because it reminds me of some work that we're currently doing, again, within this environmental and, and gentrification space and what we're learning about policy and systems change. And, and we often fund the advancement of the policy win. So even if we can get within the policy language, our needs met, where it falls apart then is implementation because this is where funders step out of the community. They don't fund the organizations to continue to bring community voice into the implementation process. Um, and so often the best laid policies and plans results in poor implementation. And so, so I think where collective action can step in is really being sure that the dollars are there to continue the policy work beyond the legislative change. Thank you. One last question. Hello, my name is um, Berlinda Mojica, and I'm a master's student here at the Ed School. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, Michael, reminded me of a quote from this week in, in one of our classes. Um, it's from Jenks on e equal opportunity, um, but I, it made me think about the equity um, part that you were mentioning, and so I wanted to share with, um, that with you before I share my question. Um, it says, we all assume that equity is compatible with our vision of a good society. Since we disagree about what such a society should look like, we, should, we usually disagree about the meaning of equity as well. And so when I was thinking about that quote, I was thinking about this intentional recruitment of people who are willing to go into the community and stand with the community. And so I'm, my question for you is, how do you intentionally recruit um, individuals that have a vision at all of equity in the first place, and then a vision that even aligns with what your organization is trying to do. Well, the beauty of working at PolicyLink at an organization that is 70 people, predominantly of color, is you can't work there if you can't talk about race. It's a prerequisite. It's, a, it's a, literally, it is a job requirement, whether you're white or whatever, and we all are on our journey. But if you're white, this is where you can come and cut your chops because it's expected. You're going to be out there just like everybody else. You can't say, oh, I can't be there. I, don't, I should not be doing this work. Yes, you should. So this is a cultural expectation. It's a leadership expectation. So to do equity work at PolicyLink means you're going to be in community. So if you can't do that, you will not be there. You'll get fired. That is literally what will happen to you. Now, we will develop you, but there can't be you won't do it. You might you can't do it to start and have to be willing to do it, and then we'll help you. But if the answer is won't, we'll help you find another place to go work. And so it's a very clear expectation that at PolicyLink that this is the work. And it starts with how we police ourselves. Because we say that our work is grounded in the voice, wisdom, of exp and experience of community. Anything that we offer up from a policy standpoint came out of working community. So if we can't do that, our currency, while it is thought leadership, the greater currency is our connected to connection in place to people. So if you can't make that connection, you can't do the job. And so just as other folks would have a criteria around you can write and you can do these other things, this is just as important as your ability to write, your ability to think, your ability to think critically. It's, it's a fundamental skill set to get in the door.
How, how hard is it these days, Michael or Jennifer or Laura, in your exploration to find leaders to lead this work that we're talking about in the way that you've been talking about it? Well, I'll just say the good news is that it, uh, it's, it's not a problem finding people to do this work, who want to do this work, who have the heart to do this work. It's a problem of finding talent who know how. Mm -hmm. I find that folks have been really good students, but they can't lead themselves out of a paper bag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the reason for that is they haven't found their voice because in many cases you can go to school to your whole life and you've never really figured out what do you want to do? What's your point of view about leading? What is your point of view about equity? It's hard to lead folks when you actually don't know what you think about it for real. Once you get past all the pat statements, and so what I like about policy LinkedIn is you have to have the conditions to create a space for people to find their voice in this work. I find people have the heart and the desire and the passion. They just haven't had the, the actual good coaching, the good education that allows people to find their muscle to do it effectively. Fair enough. Jennifer? Yeah, I mean, I think the, a, a big part of the work that we do is building capability of individuals in communities to do this work. And so we've invested a lot in our team to build their capability to lead on, on results count leadership and build those capabilities in within communities. So I think, to Michael's point, I agree. I, I think in certain communities, it's harder to find talent, certainly, and we're across, uh, across the country, and, and many of our partnerships would say that recruiting talent is a huge challenge, but I think the bigger challenge is really uh, developing, uh, developing leaders to lead in this way, where you have informal authority and you're there to, uh, to pull expertise out of the room and bring your expertise when appropriate and knowing to do that, that's an advanced adaptive leadership skill. And so a lot of our work is about building the capability of those leaders in the community. I would, I would only concur. I, I think that I couldn't add much to that other than that. But I, I do think it's not for a lack of desire or will. I, I think it's a lack of, of skill, uh, particularly within the white community, to just get comfortable mm -hmm. uh, taking those risks and getting comfortable failing, which I just think is hard, hard to do. Okay, we aim to have a thoughtful, provocative discussion, and uh, I hope you'll agree with me that we've had exactly that. So please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you.